Uh, thank you, Michelle, for your very honest sharing. Um, basically, so like most people in California, we probably understand public schools, we probably understand private schools, and we are very happy to, um, you know, we have very little knowledge, probably uh, based on my own experience, knowing about charter school and the homeschooling, even though I am forced to be a homeschool parent right now, but I'm just starting my uh, journey. And to be a whole parent, and I started, I started to explore what explore what we can do. So that's why I definitely heard, uh, you know, uh, I was seriously, um, you know, told if the, uh, our school uh, choice initiative will include um, the homeschooling uh, homeschoolers without their uh, willingness, they are possibly filing a counterback petition to fight against the school choice initiative, which. Um, you know, that's we don't want to see. So um, anyway, um, so according to my own uh, experience, we have to listen to every group and uh, we have to respect every um, every group's, uh, you know, their needs and wants. And also we have to find the common ground, the largest common ground. So uh, currently the uh, California has the, um, let's see, let me show you what we, um, so we, California has approximately six, 6.6 .6 million K-12 students, 6 million attending public schools, and 475, uh, 471,000 uh, attending private schools, and 84,000 attending homeschool, according to the Legislative Analysis uh, Office. Um, I'm just reading some data about how many schools and students in California. Uh, so I can put this uh, information into the chat box. So, uh, I'm I'm going to uh, uh, open a first question for Lance. Well, for, first of all, Lance and uh, Michelle, thank you very much, uh, Lance, for the presentation and Michelle for the uh, uh, discussion on the um, uh, from uh, a particular family of the view. Uh, my question, what I have heard is, I have quite many questions, but I think the first question is, as we all know, California housing prices is based on quality of school. So, and that, that has been, um, that, that, that's, uh, that's, that's absolutely, because if you go to, uh, you go to a high price area, typically uh, school quality is better. So um, have you, uh, Lance, have you guys uh, do an analysis as to what this uh, proposed uh, proposal and if passed and in, uh, four years, what's going to happen to the real estate price? And I think that there would, uh, a lot of people would want to know that. Um, those are good questions. We have not done deep analysis on the real estate uh, side of it, but acknowledge that you're right. When you generally move to a more expensive area, the schools are generally better, right? Um, that said, there was a book written by a scholar named Lance Azumi at Pacific Research Institute he wrote it years ago, and it uh, basically went through and, and did analysis of all the school districts in the state and how expensive the home and real estate prices were. And what he found out was something very interesting, that just because you buy a home in uh, St. Marin or uh, Silicon Valley or Beverly Hills, Orange County, just because you buy a home there doesn't mean your school is going to be as good as you think it's going to be. Um, and so I uh, would encourage anybody who wants to read that book. It's called uh, Not As Good As You Think by Lance Azumi. I'll put the, the, the link in the, the chat. But that said, we're hoping that what this does is this improves the quality of education um, outside of the public schools in our neighborhoods, that it actually attracts good educators, good schools, and parents to generally stay in their neighborhoods so they can continue to build up the kind of um, uh, economic and political collateral that will improve their neighborhoods. Um, if they don't have options right now, a lot of my friends and maybe some of your friends are moving to places like Tennessee or Idaho, Arizona, Florida, um, uh, Georgia. Those are all people that I've talked to in the last two months of my friends. And so we think the best way to keep real estate um, working in California is to actually have decent schools in our neighborhood, but they don't have to be the district schools. 
um, that are we're forced to send our kids to based upon their zip codes. So Jason, I don't know if that completely answers your question. It's a hard analysis to do, but we think more options, more innovation, more competition will bring better education and improve California going forward. Is, uh, is that analysis in your future plan? Say, I'm sorry, it's the analysis where? Uh, a follow-up question, is that analysis impact on the property uh, price in your future plan? Um, no, but I can, I can get some for you. Okay. Uh, we are open up for questions. Any have questions, um, uh, you can either put in the chat room or, uh, that, uh, or you raise your hand, we can uh, unmute you. I can answer a couple of questions in the chat if you want me to, Jason. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I saw a shout uh, uh, to everyone. Thank you for your leadership. Uh, sorry, we have to do two similar petitions at the same time. Question uh, number one, when will be fixed California petition form be available? I think you have answered that question, right, Ryan? Yeah, Thank it you. should. I'm hoping to have them in my possession by tomorrow and we'll be distributing them throughout the state this next week. So in the next week or two, if you want them in your area, um, Jason, I will drive out personally and drop them right. off. Uh, currently, do you have any uh, distribution channel uh, for the petition? We are working on it right now. We just hired a volunteer, volunteer coordinator. She's down in Orange County and that's her job is to set up uh, people in each county and to get volunteers to direct the petitions. So if anybody on this um, call would like to volunteer, um, either email me, I give you my email address or chat with me in the, in the chat and I'll, I'll get you connected. Okay, so second question is, may I collect voter signatures for Fix California while I am, uh, when I am collecting signature for, oh, why I am collecting signature for the school choice petition. So this person basically asking, can you collecting signature for both drive at the same time? Yes, you can. You just have to make sure that people are aware they're two different, um, they're two different proposals. And we will, for those that want to collect for us, we'll send out a, a fact sheet so that you know what, um, what this one actually does. And, uh, and that you can differentiate between the two. But I understand that some people volunteered to sign up with the other one because they didn't know we existed until recently. And uh, if you've already committed, I'm a person of my word. So if you've already told them you'd help them, I don't ask you to stop helping them. I only ask that you help us too. So uh, follow up with that thread, uh, I'm going to ask you, what do you think the best um, one and two and three uh, items to distinguish those two drives? What are the major difference? I, I think what people wanted to see big impact items as well. Um, the biggest items, and they're, again, because I helped draft both of them, 95% of the language is almost identical. But the big issues that are different are the means testing is the first one. Um, we talked to a lot if you looked in the recall this last um, month or back in September, we weren't able to persuade a lot of Democrats to, uh, to recall the governor, right? They have to buy into this. And so it's the same with this kind of proposal. Uh, while I'm conservative and, and vote that way, I also want my Democratic friends to buy into this too. And so we provided a means testing approach because that's how they feel it could be um, equitable for those that are lower income. Now, we also know too, that you just don't have enough seats right now in private schools. So we wanted to at least allow for that to work out over a period of time. So the means testing and phase in is the one approach. The second one that's significantly different is um, we put a cap on the college savings for a reason. One, the average cost of tuition in the state of California for a private school is just above $13,000 a year. But that's also when you account for a lot of schools that are you know, charging $70,000 tuition per kid. That's not how most of these are. So if you actually cut out the top 
um, portion of private schools in the state, the average is actually somewhere between seven to $8,000 a year. So let's just say you were to spend $8,000 a year, K through uh, 12, that's 13 years, and you were to accumulate about $5,000 a year in extra money. You didn't pay for any tutors, you didn't use it for any extracurricular activities or for uh, childcare, you would only be saving roughly around $60,000 anyway. And so what we wanted to do is encourage parents to get the best education in their K through 12 education as possible. Now, that money will index over time. So inflation, it will grow. That $60,000 number is uh, what it is now, but maybe 10 years from now, it's 80, 90, $100,000. So it could change. But also at the California State University system, average tuition is just under $15,000 a year. So if you go to four years of college, that would pay for tuition. And then the third difference is, again, we don't allow for non or unaffiliated uh, homeschoolers to participate as Michelle was talking about. Um, and it wasn't because we didn't like them. We just felt like if they didn't want to have government money coming in through their programs, we didn't want to make them feel obligated to participate. And we also didn't think it was fair for some families to save up that money, um, upwards of a quarter million dollars, only to spend it on college that might not benefit the state education system in, in total. And so it's, again, it's not a perfect, um, it's not a perfect proposal. There are things I wish I could do a little bit differently, but we think it's a bold proposal and it's the most expansive um, education reform in the entire United States that's before the people right now. Um, there's no other state that goes this far. Other, some other states like Arizona, um, West Virginia, Florida have small um, education savings accounts. Ours, if it passes, will change education in the entire country, not just California. Um, you just mentioned uh, main casting as one of the uh, major ex uh, difference. Is that's that that's the the facing uh, dollar Correct. amount. Right? That's what you're talking about. Correct. So if you, okay. your family earns less than a hundred thousand dollars a year for the first two years, you're in. They we double that for the next two years, and then after year five and beyond, it's anybody's eligible. Okay. Okay. Um, so uh, we're, we're going through uh, we're going through the uh, uh, the questions. So one of the questions from this person um, they don't have a name, but it's uh, USA. So the first question is: uh, Is it too uh, Lance, uh, instead of me reading, I think everybody can see this. Uh, maybe you can just- uh, Yeah, I know it. which question you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, USA, I think you even have your hand raised. I appreciate the question. Um, anybody can, can opt out of their public schools now and go to private school, um, the, but may or may not be eligible for this. And at the beginning, um, again, it's not because we're trying to be mean or exclude people. We're trying to make sure that it's it's prudent, that it works out all right. And so we don't advocate for parents to take drastic measures um, to qualify, but we really think that a good number of people will qualify within the few, first few years. Um, so it, again, we had to draw the line somewhere. I wouldn't qualify under the first two years in my family. Um, so again, I understand I have five kids. Something like this is very, um, uh, exciting for us, but my wife and I will have to, you know, sit and, and wait until it would be available to us or just continue on with good public schools. That's another point I want to make too. This is not, while we know that public schools suffer in California and have their problems, there are a lot of good public schools and good charter schools in the state. And so we're, we're telling people, if you really like your public school, there's no need to opt into this program. Um, it would be a good option if you didn't have that opportunity, but we're not saying that we're going to shut down uh, public schools. This is just simply another choice. And frankly, even if it doesn't benefit you or your family directly, we would appreciate your support because if we can get people to, to allow for more competition and innovation in private schools, then I think the market will work out some pretty incredible opportunities for kids. Um. I believe uh, Michelle Neal is about to add a couple of points, uh, you know, to answer USA's questions. Actually, I, I had a question. 
I, I noticed in the um, in the presentation, Lance, it said, and I might be saying this wrong, but it said that the initiative alters the constitution or it alters something. Yes. What it, so this alteration, um, is this altering SB 777? No, so the constitution doesn't deal with any statutes. The part of the constitution that this actually changes is what they call the Blaine Amendments. For those of, of you that are familiar with what Blaine Amendments are, is it's a general prohibition um, for the state to spend money on religious education. And there was a Supreme Court case last year that came out and it was called uh, Espinoza versus Montana. And the Supreme Court of the United States said, if any money that's public money, taxpayer money goes to a private school, you can't not allow that to go to a, a private religious school. And so, and that's, I'm, I'm not a lawyer. That's just kind of the summary of the, of the, of the, uh, the Supreme Court's decision. So what we did is we actually made that explicit in this initiative. We said that the Blaine amendments don't pertain to this money. And obviously the Supreme Court already ruled on that issue, but we wanted to be very explicit. So that's the, the only real constitutional, well, there's one other small constitutional, constitutional change. We expand the basis for Proposition 98 counting. Again, in California, we only count those students underneath the school funding formula, Prop 98, um, for those that go to public schools. So if you're not in a public school and you're in a private school, which is about 600,000 students, give or take, uh, a lot more this last year. But if you're within that group, we don't count you within that formula. What we're doing going forward is we're going to count every student in there so the money is more equally divided, if that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. How does this how does this, and I know we talked about this before, so maybe you're still looking into it. Um, how do we get these protections that we need? Um, have we gotten any closer? Yeah, so the protections already exist in state law. Now, are those protections everything we want going forward? The, the legislature can do anything it wants at any point in time to change those protections. I would say though, having worked in the legislature for 17 years, that most of the legislators that deal with education issues send their kids to private schools. And so they're not likely to change the rules for the kids that, for their own kids, that's one. Two, um, even if uh, there were some changes for private schools, um, it would impact everybody, probably including homeschools as well, right? Because if homeschools are private schools, they're going to make those changes across the board. Um, this ballot initiative does as much as it can to continue on with those protections. But what we decided not to do, and Jason, this is another small point that's worth noting, we didn't actually, we weren't explicit about private school protections. And that was for, that was intentional. Because in my experience, the minute that you start giving a target for the legislature to shoot at, they'll blow it up as fast as they can. And I warned the other team that if they actually provided explicit protections, that those explicit protections would be nullified the day that this passed. And so we didn't want to provide that sort of fodder for the other team. So we do have more questions actually in chat box. Uh, so Lance, would you like to take a look? Or uh, we can just um, you know highlight the questions that we read about it. So here, one of the friend called uh, USA. She's uh, she asked three questions. I think we didn't finish answering her, especially the last I've, one. Why? So, yeah. So yeah, let me let me just I'll go through those really quickly. I, I think I said before I don't think you should take any drastic measures to change your family or divorce or that kind of stuff. Again, this is one of these things where. It's going to take a lot of resources. We expect that the California Teachers Association is gonna spend a lot of money to oppose this, a lot of money. So it's gonna cost us a decent amount of money to get it on, but once it's on the ballot, we're gonna to have to protect it at that point in time. So that's one. Two is um, we, it's difficult for us to go through and say um, that we want this money for 
for K through 12 and then continue to talk about college uh, savings um, going forward. I'm not putting that down, but most colleges or most kids have, have better access to scholarships, grants, or government funding. They don't have that K through 12. So again, that was our specific focus on capping it at $60,000. Um, we really think that a lot of uh, families will probably want to roll that money over. Again, if you don't spend it all the first year, your balance rolls over to the next year. And then it all indexes with inflation. So it's not 13,000 per year. It could be in five years, 15, 16, $17,000 per year. And it could be that that balance continues to roll over so that if you wanted to go to a really nice high school um, that maybe costs more money than your elementary or middle school, that you could do that. And so there's that. And then again, with the private affidavits, as Michelle said, this is a complicated situation. Some uh, private school affidavits wanted access to this. Many did not. Um, and there are people on this call that feel differently about it both ways. And I understand that. This was not meant to fix or deal with that stuff. But what we did know is that if people want to do homeschooling through a private school, that there might be a lot of innovation for that. And so this provides for that kind of innovation. And it doesn't mean they have to spend a lot of money. They could probably bank a lot of money at the beginning and have a decent private school experience. Um, so I think that answers her questions generally. I'm sure there's more specific ones to come up, um, but uh, th that's the general approach. Right. Um, I, I'm uh, reading you this, uh, Jack, that uh, a question about, uh, he said, that I noticed the presentation didn't show us a school as a place we can collect signature. Can we do it when we pick up picking up a kid? Oh yeah, sorry, and I didn't put every possible place, but yeah, absolutely. You can do it um, when you're dropping your kids off or picking them up at sporting events, uh, extracurricular activities. If, you're, if your PTA allowed it, you could do it there. I don't think they will, but you could do it anywhere that's a, a public area um, where you're not interfering with the education of the kids. Um, generally, you know, at the, the sidewalk or on the curb, those kinds of places, you could absolutely do it. Okay, then, uh, we have uh, uh, George raising hand. George, uh, George Young's uh, uh, our old friends and uh, uh, George. Uh, hold on, uh, hold on, hold on. Uh, I think uh, uh, Rub Rubin, right? <laughs> Rubin uh, raise the oh. hands first. Then can uh, Rubin talk first? Then George. Can, can we? Let, sure. Let's. Uh, yeah, I. Um, okay, uh, I I think that uh, we have the uh, next two questions. Well, the first one is uh, Ruben, right? Yes, Robin. Robin. Yeah, Robin. Hi, I'm sorry, Robin. One, yeah. The second one, would be, uh, second one would be George. Go ahead, okay. Robin. That's okay, thank you. First of all, thank you for this presentation and all your thoughtfulness. And um, um, I know that you have tried to very carefully craft this um, bill or this initiative. Um, I, and I also, I should say, I applaud you for not including private homeschoolers who file their own affidavits um, as far as getting the ESAs. I still think that there's some concerns, some real concerns with homeschooling issues, but I wanna bring up the concern about uh, private schools, especially private Christian schools um, that care a lot about teaching, um, teaching biblical values, biblical values on marriage, biblical values on gender, uh, which are at odds with already existing education code uh, in the non-discrimination area. So like education, this will make more sense probably to Lance maybe than to some others, but education code uh, 200 and 220 and 221, where basically uh, the existing code already says no person shall be discriminated on the basis of, and then there's a lot of different categories. Those categories include gender, gender identity, gender expression, race or ethnicity, sexual orientation, and others. So basically 220 is saying that um, you can't discriminate in these areas in any program or activity conducted by an educational institution that receives or benefits state financial assistance or enrolls pupils who receive state student financial aid. Um, and so it's not just 220, it's kind of a combination of things, but Kind of the bottom line concern for a lot of people is for the Christian schools that want and um, 
Christian schools or even schools that are not distinctively Christian who do not want to get into all the gender expression, gender identity things, those things come with um, indirect and direct funding. Um, and, and of course, there is an ex exception which gets a little in the weeds. If a school is not, if the school is part of an established religious institution, whose religious tenets clearly spell out our beliefs on these things, uh, they might not be affected, but the other people will. So I would just like to say, I realize why you didn't put in protections, quote unquote, because they can be struck down easily. But that's why many of us are very concerned about bringing in any kind of direct or indirect um, monies into private schools. If you're a secular school, you don't you may not care about this but for those who care about biblical values or just pract for practical reasons want to leave some of the gender identity and gender expression all of that out um it seems to me that it's dangerous to be accepting the money so i'm wondering um lance i'm sure this question isn't new to you uh what's your thought on that so robin very thoughtful question i'll just be really brief because we, you and I, and I'm in favor and in interaction with you because you clearly know the law and the code. Um, there is no way for us to completely think about every possible um, walk around on this on this proposal. What we try to do is allow for those private schools that want to participate to have the opportunity. And I didn't mention this earlier. Again, it's a two way street. This is not only an opt in for the student but it's an opt-in for the school as well. And I, I'm gonna have to make that more explicit in my presentation. So just because somebody wants to go to a particular school, if they're not willing to opt in, then again, that limits the choices, right? But we also know there are a lot of schools that are willing to take the money, even as a religious uh, organization because of their financial straits. Um, that might be a choice. It might be a choice that some of them have already moved on in terms of some of these cultural issues. Um, I'm not suggesting that's the way this needs to go, but I'm also hoping that the current protections for those religious institutions that already exist will continue to be protected because I think those are constitutional issues that the state legislature would have a hard time getting around. Now, is that going to automatically protect every school um, in terms of what they want to do in terms of curriculum, admitting kids that have different cultural or religious beliefs? I don't think that's gonna be a challenge, but I think the constitutional protections are decently strong now, as long as the, the courts want to uphold that stuff. But again, I'm not holding my breath. I'm in this wide, eyes wide open. Um, I see this as an opportunity for also a lot of other schools like trade or technical schools that want to operate and have a, a field for which those issues are not a big deal to them, but will we'll cater to a lot of your trade, technical, vocational type institutions as well. Um, but again, a religious institution has to take this in consideration. One really quick fact, the, out of the, the private schools in the state of California, 40% of them are run or operated by the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church is not supporting the other initiative. In fact, they're, they're opposing it as far as I understand it um, as a church. But with ours, they're willing to keep their eyes open on it and consider it should it get enough um, signatures. Now, that's not an automatic thing. I'm not putting any words in their mouth, but as I've had conversations with them, they see the value of allowing more kids to get access to their schools um, while understanding too, they have to protect the religious institution as well. So again, sure. that's not a perfect answer for you, but let's interact, send me your email and I'll uh, like follow up with you. Okay, I appreciate that, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Robert. Uh, next, George, go ahead. So uh, one comment, first of all, if I go to a good public school, I think it's a good thing to have this option so that we, we have more leverage to talk to school administrator. So this is one of the talking points for both propositions. When we go to a good school district, like say Mano Park or Fremont, it's a good thing to say, having this option will give us more leverage when we negotiate with the school administration. Uh, my question actually comes, uh, kind of follow up the question about the Catholic schools. They have a very big system in the state. So I want to find out what are their objections to the other proposition and why they have not and how can you, can we secure their support on this proposition? 
and whether or not they can help connect signatures on their properties and on their school grounds. All right, I'm uh, yeah, thank you, George. Um, good questions. My my experience with most, a good majority of the volunteers for the other ballot initiative are they are awesome, incredible volunteers. Uh, a lot of them came to this because they had understood at the time that the California Policy Center, where I was executive vice president, was on board with it. When we made the split, which is unfortunate, like any divorce or separation in a family, we tried every possible opportunity to bring these two back together. And it didn't happen. I tried probably two times and I had a phone call uh, just last week with one of their main people to try to tell them that it would be better if we could just do one initiative and be focused and bring all the volunteers together. They were not willing to do that. So the main issue that really bothers them is this idea of a means testing approach. Like I talked about a phase and approach. We, I've talked to too many Democrats who said if without a phase and approach, they won't support this. And all I need is 50% plus one vote for this to become law. And so it's important in the state of California when there's only 25, 27% of the voters are, are uh, Republicans, um, another 20 some percent are independents. Um, you still need to get people that are moderate on the other side that wanna help. And that's why we brought over state Senator Gloria um, Romero. She is an incredible spokesperson who used to be the majority leader in the state Senate for the Democratic party. Um, she's going to be a huge advocate in places like LA where she runs a charter school. So, and in Orange County. So, we think that there's an opportunity for us to get together. And I think as other volunteers on the other team understand what we're offering, that it has a better chance to succeed, that they're going to want to help us out. And again, I'm not asking any volunteers on the other team to reject or walk away from their efforts. I am asking them, though to come and support ours as much as they can. And if they can support ours, I think that we're going to have the resources and the political ability to get this across the finish line. Uh, uh, Lance, uh, I heard uh, uh, yesterday I searched uh, Gloria Romero and uh, it was uh, announced that uh, she is in support of uh, ESA. So that was the good news because uh, she is the former uh, speaker of the uh, Democratic Caucus and uh, she has uh, She's also an educator and has a lot of influence. So uh, congratulations, guys. Uh, I, I think that uh, it's a picking up a momentum and we just have to, uh, uh, to uh, get it going. I see a lot of uh, different things that uh, under, the, uh, under the plan that uh, was designed to uh, make sure um, that uh, uh, most of our uh, stakeholders uh, interest being considered, but uh, uh, rights not be intruded. So that's a well done piece of uh, a proposal. Thank you very much. Thank you. And do we have more questions to ask? Because I definitely noticed that George has what is a question in the chat box. What's the Catholic school system's position on both? And can we collect signatures on Catholic school grounds? You would have to ask the, obviously those schools if they wanted, Catholic, the Catholic church does not have a position on either of these, but if you I'm not Catholic, but if you're familiar with the Catholic church, the, the bishops um, and the, the priests of these various parishes control their churches and, and largely their schools, you'd have to get their permission. We are talking to a lot of lay Catholics who want to help support this. And obviously they have kids in these schools, um, but there's a lot of people that have kids in different kinds of schools that aren't religious or parochial, um, if they're secular. Um, so those might be opportunities to go to those schools as well. Um, and I think that, again, I've been talking to a lot of different private school organizations. They're still watching this carefully. They haven't quite decided how far in support they wanna go. Not because they're not interested in this, but because like everybody else, they've watched how the state is really, really tough on, on education these days. So. Um, we're doing what we can to help convince people that at least giving um, families a choice and an opportunity uh, to take their kids to a better school than, than a school that's failing them is, I think, worth supporting this initiative, even if 
they don't get any benefit out of. Um, uh, let me answer this question really quickly. Uh, uh, the question was about the two identical um, titles on the on the initiatives. That's a challenge. But if you look on the initiative petition itself, on the page that you sign, if you go up right above it, it actually has the name of the group that's sponsoring it. So the, you're not going to read all of the fine print. Both of initi the initiatives, if you were to print them out on regular paper, is 11 pages long. So you're not going to read all that. Um, you can. You're welcome to. But if you just go to the page that you signed it on, um, actually, I, I can show you really quick if you if we want to do a screen share. Give me one second here. Yeah, great, uh, Lance. Uh, we need to see that so that. Uh, we... Yeah, let me let me show you some slides really quickly. And I, again, I apologize that I didn't have this up on the other um, version. Actually, no, it's this one. Sorry. Sure. Okay, so. Here, I'll just run through this really quick. So this is what the petition looks like here. Now this is the page right at the very beginning. And this number right here, it says 21001111A1. Um, and, and I'll describe, that's the number of our initiative. So if you want to know which one's ours, it's 11. The other one is 06. So that's one way to know. Yeah, Lance, isn't that uh, Fix California is the, the the brand name for it? So if you see Correct. Fix California, you are you are it, right? That's much easier to remember. Yeah, so I'm going to show you that right. Um, actually, it's above this page. I didn't I didn't do the rest of this page, but right above this section, it will say Fix California on it, and education savings accounts. But also, here's the other way too. And again, this is kind of we're letting people know. The other team only has six signature lines. If you count that, we have seven. So if you see one with six, that's the other teams. If you see one with seven, that's our teams. And so um, we have more opportunities to gather those signatures. But I'm gonna write that down so that I can let people know the difference. And then really quickly, um, there will be a notice for top funders. So if people donate more than $50,000, uh, the top three funders will be on a page that will be separate and different. Um, you can be volunteered or a paid signature gatherer, but most people are only paid through another vendor. If you volunteer, you just do it because you want to. Um, people have the right to withdraw their signatures if they want, but um, that that's, happens in the future. And then um, you collect on the petition uh, per county. So if you're in Santa Clara County or San Francisco or Alameda or Sacramento or LA or Orange County that have to do a different page for the different places. And all of the stuff has to fit in this box. So your name, your address and your signature uh, to make that happen. Um, and then once all that's done, then you sign a declaration at the bottom of that and then you send it in. And I can do more detailed um, discussion about how this actually works uh, at another time, but we're going to put videos together that really walk through this whole thing. I just want to make sure that uh, you understand what, what, what I was talking about. I'm going to stop sharing now. So Lance, a uh, uh, question, if, uh, if you, uh, if, if let's say I sign one, uh, one uh, drive and signature, and later on, I forgot, and you know, a month pass. I'm signing another. So, what if there's a double entry of your name on the same? So, what what what's the process? Would that be a problem, or that's not a problem? Um, I mean, it's not a problem for us because we're going to validate a hundred percent of all the signatures we get. So, when we get a signature in, we have a database. We'll correct. We'll connect it against that database. And if you've already signed, we'll just get rid of the one you've the second one you signed. That said, I want you just to also understand there is a protection as a voter. We don't collect any information off of the people signing the petitions, uh, except if they give us their information separate from the petition. So in other words, I can't go through the petition and write your name down and get your address and all that stuff. But if I hand you another sheet of paper and you say, yes, I'd like to get involved, then you can sign up that way. So there's some protections for voters. And um, if they 
If they're not sure if they voted on or signed it at some point in time, they can sign again. But if it's duplicate, we'll get rid of one of those. Got it. Thank you. Your questions from Liang, uh, I believe is a, the person I know. So the thing is, um, if even if someone wants to sign both petition, they cannot be sure whether they signed the same uh, the same one twice or not. So perhaps is there is a way to include a cover for the petition so that the cover is a different color. So you can ask, did you sign the one with the red cover? So easier for identification. So is no, we that can do, we can do something like that? I mean, the petitions look exactly the same. But if we have a, a color that goes along with it, we can do that. I don't think that most people are going to understand the difference, but we'll, we'll, we'll try. Yeah. So there are so many ways to distinguish the two initiatives if you just really pay attention to the details. Uh, just like George says, uh, one petition um, says uh, 14K um, you know, per student uh, per year. And the other is 13K, which is us, $13,000 per year. That's very yeah. easy to identify. Mm -hmm. So the other one is, you know, numbers are always easy to distinguish. So we do have the cap uh, for the unused um, amount of money be saved uh, up to $60,000 per year. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, at most to pay for their college uh, or the uh, vocational schools. So the people do ask why there is a cap, but um, so I think Lance, you covered this, uh, this part, but probably it's better for you to explain a little bit why we need to set the cap. Yeah, so the cap doesn't come into play until they go to college. So if you're in elementary school, kindergarten, first, second, third, fourth, fifth grade, and you keep accumulating, but you're only spending five or $6,000 a year, then that money will accumulate unlimited until you graduate high school. At that point in time, again, we're trying to keep it all focused in the primary and secondary education, not higher education. There's already lots of money going to colleges right now. And so we wanted to focus it there. And parents can make the best decisions that, that, uh, about their kids' education and finances. Um, so we want them to make those decisions. But we also didn't want them just to tuck it away and not spend it when it's the most important part of their lives to get the best part of their education as a young child. It's definitely true. So uh, up, uh, upon my discussion with many parents who are actually more experienced parents, you know, uh, for many years more than I do. Um, so they said, uh, you know, to, according to our initiative, we want to encourage people to actually spend the money to support their children's K-12 education. They want to prevent um, the, uh, prop, you know, some families want to save up the money to use for college. So you better say, um, put a cap there that allows the money will be actually spent on K-12 education, which is, you know, number one, good for your children. Number two, can uh, make our initiative less attractable from the leftist side. So otherwise people can easily attack us for scamming money. And also according to the, the budget, you know, passing through the legislation, um, the like, uh, experience um, the legislative, um, uh, how to say, um, uh, people. So tell that the less money or say the less budget you put this initiative could be possibly uh, easier to win. Here, um, let me see. So people are, people are actually uh, giving good suggestions about how to distinguish the two um, initiatives. So when we are doing the, uh, the petition, so. Yeah, and I'm writing those down. And when we do more training on this, I'll let people know. But honestly, if you're at, you know, your son's soccer game or at a school board meeting or your church, most people won't know the difference. You just have to explain to them that this is a good opportunity for them to get the most choice for their kids' education. And even if in the state of California, only 25% of voters have kids in school right now, so that means we got to get a lot of grandparents and neighbors and family and friends to support this as well. So I think when people understand it, they'll, they'll do it. And again, I encourage anybody who is on the fence about doing this, sign both of them. I have no problem signing both of them, but I would just say in the end, I think ours is going to have the most bipartisan support to get it across the finish line. Definitely. So right now our time is nearly 10 o'clock. 
So according to our plan, we're going to wrap up this meeting uh, in three minutes. So whoever would like to ask a question, please uh, speed up. Okay, uh, let me ask one more question. Um, so I heard all the numbers uh, throwing around for uh, average uh, cost for each student in California. And at around 22,000, I don't know if that number is uh, right or wrong, but uh, can you share some light? How do you guys arriving at the 13,000 and the 14,000? How's that number coming from? Yes, so good question, um, Jason. The total amount of money spent this last year or to, to be spent this next year, excuse me, is around $21,500. Now that includes state funds, that includes federal funds and other funds. And the way it breaks down is out of that 21,500, about 13 and a half of that is the state funds and the rest is other things. Now this last year when we had the, uh, the CARES Act and some of the recovery stimulus funds from the federal government, that number actually increased dramatically, but those are one-time funds. So we're not counting that at all. So. The only money that we can deal with because we're not changing federal law, we're only changing state law, is the state Proposition 98 money, which is $13,500-ish. The reason we didn't go above and max out um, to over $14,000 like the other group did was because I've actually, in the 17 years I was in the legislature, there were three years where I didn't get paid for three or four months because the budget was so bad. They actually had to cut education funding for a period of time and they had to delay payments. So in my experience, I didn't want to go to the ceiling. I wanted to create a little bit of a buffer. And so we went with 13,000. It's almost, I mean, it's very close to the 14,000, but we thought 13,000 gets us close. But again, that also adjusts with inflation. And as the budget gets bigger for Proposition 98, which is made up mostly of of property tax money and general um, income tax for the general fund, um, most of those monies will increase over time, but there's a chance they might decrease. And we didn't want to get stuck having to drop ours down. We wanted to be able, we could scale up in a way that wouldn't decrease over time. I fear that the other team went too high and that they might have to drop down at some point in time, which would be unfortunate. Um, but again, I spent some time in the Department of Finance. I did Proposition 98 as an analyst there. I worked for Governor Schwarzenegger years ago on uh, at um, Department of Finance, and I also sat as a chief consultant for the state budget for three different members of the legislature. So I know the budget well. I know how it works. Um, the thirteen thousand dollar number was what I thought to be a good, solid number, um, but we'll have to see what happens. We don't know how the economy is ever going to go, but I hope that it continues to improve. Thank you, good answer. And then really quickly, some questions about the actual petition itself. Uh, state law requires it all be on one piece of paper. So we have it printed on both sides. The font has to be, I think 11 point font is the smallest it can be. And so we've got it spaced pretty tightly on both sides, but it's something you actually have to fold up twice. And the one side that's folded up that you'll see is that the actual signature side, right in the center, that's where we'll say education savings accounts which is ours. The other one's called the Education Freedom Act, which is different. So if you can see those two different things, so there's no stapling it, there's no printing it out, and it can't be done um, online yet. I know that we live, or that you represent Silicon Valley and computers and technology and the internet, but for some reason, we haven't figured out how to do this online yet. So hopefully one day soon. Okay. Uh, I think we are up against the uh, hour and a half. Uh, very informative. And Lance, thank you very much. And Michelle, thank you very much for the support for all the participants to spend uh, uh, 90 minutes with us. That uh, we know that uh, a big change, a big proposal for the California education system is hopefully uh, with. Uh, with uh, our help, with all the volunteer help and, uh, and the resource that we can uh, put both on, on the uh, ballot next year. And uh, uh, this would uh, actually help California. Uh, I think it both help the um, California voters, parents, kids, 
and uh, hope and also help the government because we uh, we save money for them, right? So uh, yep. so do they so they 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 don't waste money, uh, you know. They nowadays. So I think uh, um, uh, I think we we do uh, owe a big thank you to Lance. Uh, he had uh, ninety minutes, and we patiently answer a lot of questions and. Uh, uh, a, uh, and you, uh, I understand you have uh, temporarily left your job and uh, full time on this, uh, part of your dedication to the cause. And this is a huge wave for the, for us, or uh, for, uh, I, as I said in my opening statement, education is cross parties and cross racial boundaries. Every parent wants the best for their kids, and uh, we um, California is the is our home, and we want to make our home better. Um, and for the rest of we we have the technology and we have the innovation idea. There's no really no reason for government to say you based on your home address has to go to this public school while all the people who made the money, rich people that uh, can spend money on private school, wherever they, well, I understand my governor is uh, sending uh, his kids to a private school and they don't even comply with the state mandate for, for a mask. So, so I would say that's the ultimate um, irony in, in that statement. Uh, but anyway, uh, Unfortunately, we we want to recall him, but uh, we failed. But uh, but I think education definitely is. Uh, um, uh, uh, Lance, I I want to <clears throat> personally congratulate you. Great job! And uh, when I first heard of this, I I I hit my myself by saying, why can I come out with that idea? That was great um, because uh, from what I see in the. Um, what I see across the spectrum, when you go to school, that's where parents get gets involved. When you when you you know when you what, what I always heard don't you can mess with me but don't mess with my kids right. So that's the uh, that's the saying, and uh, we need to. Um, uh, I certainly uh, uh, buy into the program, and uh, I will support both and. Uh, I think that uh, um, on behalf of uh, Silicon Valley Association, we're going to talk about that, and we definitely, um, uh, all, uh, as of now, I am personally in support of uh, uh, your effort and applaud your effort for doing a great job of putting this thing together. And thank you very much, and thank you Saga to bring us the opportunity, and thank you Michelle for that uh, participant and uh, bring the view of um, uh, the, uh, the California voters and California resident in, in a very important, uh, very important uh, topic. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jason. Um, just wanna lens, just wanna feature, there are two very special individuals on the call. Jeff Tang, he's actually um, elected official, he's a, a school board member, and also Liang Fang, um, she is the one giving lots of uh, suggestions. She's very um, talented and she's also very eager on so many fights together. Yeah. So she is actually the vice mayor of a Cooper. Right, uh, I Correct? forgot to, we forgot to so mention. So we'd like to work with you more and thank you. Uh, I forgot to mention that uh, George, George. Who, yeah, George who uh, put in the question, uh, George Yang who put in the uh, question, asking good questions. George actually is the current uh, city council of uh, Mano Park. And uh, oh, oh. George also, when he first come out uh, uh, seven years ago, 2014, he ran for Lieutenant Governor and uh, uh, we had uh, many conversations. Uh, one of the things that impressed me from George is he said uh, we uh, Asians are uh, paying a lot of attention to uh, education because we believe that's the uh, fundamental uh, for our kids' success in the future. 
And the, one of the reasons he wanted to run for lieutenant governor is lieutenant governor sits on the board of UC. And uh, UC, we have a lot of problem. As Asians, we have a lot of problem with UC right now because the, uh, the hidden discrimination against Asians uh, in the enrollment. And, uh, and they have uh, uh, subsequently canceled the SAT. And so basically, you can go into UC without uh, taking SAT, and they're basically lower the standards. So I don't know what's that going to happen for UC system, quality of UC system in the next, uh, in the future, but that's what happened now. So um, George, if you still are online, we definitely wanted to talk to you and, uh, oh, I think George has already said that he will support both. So uh, we got a, I think a, a, a saga, it got a, got his uh, endorsement as well. Awesome, phenomenal. So thank you so much, everybody. I I definitely thank you um, because I know it's Sunday and everybody needs to go back to work. So I would just say let's wrap up and thank you so much. And the, this info session has been recorded, so we are going to share later in many ways. Uh, you know, convenient. And thank you. And thanks, Lens. And thanks all the friends from Silicon Valley. Um, you know, foundation. Thank you so much. And we look forward to work with you very soon. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.